Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and continue with our elements of a crime notes. But today, what we're going to be talking about are going to be legal defenses. Now, we've kind of been going back and forth for the past couple days talking about prosecution and defense. So today, I'm going to be focusing on defense, but there's always something you have to remember. The system that we have for criminal justice is set up to favor the defense for so many reasons, as we've talked about. One, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. The prosecution, in order to get a conviction, has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, like what we've talked about before is the defendant is presumed innocent. That's what they, their status as they go into the trial. It's up to the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that yes, they did commit this crime. That's why we say they're either guilty or they are not guilty. Now, because the system is set up to favor defendants, the defense doesn't even need to necessarily present a case. During the court proceedings, prosecution always goes first. So the prosecution is going to bring really almost their entirely whole case. And then when they finish, then defense gets to go. Now, if the defense believes that the prosecution did not prove this person guilty, beyond a reasonable doubt, the defense doesn't even have to present a case. They can just say, if that's the case you have against us, fine, we'll go ahead and send the jury to go deliberate because there's no way they can convict based on what the prosecution has presented. This is why the defense is always going to go second and why the system is set up to protect the defendant. Now, they don't have to present a case, but if you spent all this money on a high-priced defense attorney, you want to be pretty certain that you're going to be found not guilty. So even though the defense doesn't have to go, they're usually going to present their side of, this, of the story as well. Oftentimes, when the defense does present their case, they're going to try to prove usually one of three things. Now, just to kind of give you an idea, I want to give you guys what these three things are. But today, I'm not going to have enough time to go through all three. Today, we're going to talk about really the first two. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is when the defense tries to prove that there, in fact, was no criminal act committed, that there was no crime. Now, I'm going to give you kind of a classic example of this, where in there are cases where someone might be on trial for rape. However, what the defense will say is there was no rape that was committed because there was consent, because it was consensual. So if it's consensual, there was no rape that was committed. Now, like I said, we're going to get into number one more as we go forward, but I do want to give you number two and number three, and we're going to talk about two today, but we'll have to put off number three until a little bit later. The second thing that a defense will often try to prove is there was a, a crime that was committed, but there was no criminal intent. Now, we're going to get more into that as we go forward today, but I do just want to go ahead and give you number three real fast as well, where, yes, they committed the act, but they're not criminally responsible. Now, again, when I see you guys a little bit later on in the week, we're going to have more time to talk about what number three entails, this idea that, yes, there was a criminal act, but it's not, in fact, criminally responsible. Now, for today, I do want to go back to number one. We're going to talk first about when the defense tries to prove that there was no criminal act actually committed. Now, what this is going to be, what, excuse me, what we're going to be talking about today is how you can sometimes prove that there was no criminal act, where the defendant might say, I did not do this. I did not commit a crime because of, and we're going to talk about proof today. First thing we're going to talk about to prove that someone did not commit a crime can be DNA evidence. Now, you guys aren't in the OJ series yet where they talk about DNA necessarily. It's going to be a little bit later on in the series. But what we're going to see the prosecution say is that this is in the mid-1990s. They have DNA evidence. They basically have OJ Simpson's blood and the blood of the two victims. Now, today, this would be basically an open and shut case. But during the 1990s, DNA evidence wasn't really understood to a level where if you showed it to a jury, they really wouldn't get it. So using DNA today 
can be almost 100% certain to prove that a defendant did not commit a crime. Now, finding DNA evidence is something that is going to be almost, uh, when you see it in a movie or you see it on TV, it seems like finding DNA evidence is really easy. But to be perfectly honest, it's not. Now, it can be obtained through several different things. You can find someone's DNA through saliva, through blood, through semen, through hair follicles. There are a lot of different places where you can get someone's DNA. But if you find DNA at a crime scene, you have to be able to match it. You have to prove whose DNA it is. So if you do, in fact, find DNA at a crime scene, you need to convince the defendant to in fact supply their DNA as well in order for there to be a match. So let me explain this in a couple of ways. First off, let's just pretend that there's blood found at a crime scene. You can extract the DNA from that blood and you can see the DNA pattern of it. Now in order to get a conviction, you need to prove whose blood that is. Now if you have someone that you believe did commit this crime, you can either one, get a warrant for them to give up their DNA, where you go through the courts, you have a judge sign it, and basically it's a court order for that person to give up DNA. They can get it through either uh, a cotton swab of, uh, of saliva, they can hand over hair follicles, they can hand over blood in order to comply with the warrant. Or law enforcement is perfectly within their rights to somewhat set up a situation where a defendant voluntarily gives up their DNA. Now, I say that, and I'm careful when I do so, because law enforcement can't just ask someone to give up DNA. They can ask them to give a blood sample. If this person complies and simply volunteers, then yeah, they'll just go ahead and give them a blood sample. But it's well within law enforcement's rights to have you accidentally give up your own DNA. I will tell you this little story because uh, a, a, a police officer told me this. They were certain of this guy committing a crime, but he was very careful and he refused to voluntarily give up the DNA. Now, this police officer tried to go get a warrant for it, but the judge said, well, there's just not necessarily enough evidence here to issue a warrant. So I need more evidence. The police had to go outside of those two traditional ways to get DNA. And what this officer did was he called this man in, this, uh, this person he thought committed the crime, for a, for a session of questioning. And when he called him in, he offered him a bottle of water. This person took the bottle of water, drank from the bottle. He was there for not very long. He answered a handful of questions, but he left the bottle of water there. On that bottle of water was this person's saliva. He, by default, voluntarily gave the police his saliva. They were able to match his DNA to the DNA that was at the crime scene and they convicted him. Now, I say this with, um, I have to be a little careful because a friend of mine who's a lawyer has said to me before that kind of the problem with DNA today is that juries think that it's really easy to find DNA. Based on just kind of TV and movies, they think that finding DNA is really easy and that's not necessarily true. Sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes you just can't find it at all. And he says, this is the inherent problem, that juries expect DNA now. And if you can't produce DNA, just in their own minds, the jury thinks, well, if there's no DNA, then there's no crime committed. There's no way to actually convict this person. So DNA is kind of a double-edged sword. It can be good and bad for prosecution. Now, there's another way to prove that someone did not commit a crime if they can produce an alibi. Now, producing an alibi, again, has some kind of strengths and weaknesses to it. But an alibi is just evidence that a defendant was not in the area where the crime was committed at the time it was committed. Now, there are a bunch of different ways to produce an alibi. You can, if you can prove it, have someone vouch for you to say that, no, no, this person was not at the area where the crime was committed at that time because they were with me during that time period. Now, if you have a person who is your alibi, they're going to have to testify on your behalf. They're going to have to go in front of the judge and the jury and produce the evidence and, and their testimony saying that, yes, I was with this person. Now, if it's 
if it's an individual saying that, yes, he was with me during this time, there can be some weaknesses there. You have to have proof instead of just your word that that person was there. Or the other attorney can, you can during the cross-examination, can ask questions to try to break down the credibility of that alibi. Having more of a concrete alibi is a much better way of doing it. If you can produce, uh, for example, like a uh, receipt that you were in a certain place other than where the crime was committed at a certain time, that's a very concrete alibi. If you can produce video footage of you being in a certain place, that's a very credible alibi. Even your cell phone can count as an alibi because, and it's not perfect, but cell phone companies can somewhat triangulate as to where you and your phone are at certain times. If the cell phone company can produce records saying that, no, his phone was in this particular area during that when the crime was committed, then yes, it's possible that that can be an alibi. Now, I need to tell you guys this. I'm running out of time on how long I can record, so I want to pause right here, but there will be another piece to this lecture series today. I want to go ahead and explain number two, where no criminal intent was involved. So be certain that you also watch number two of this video as well, coming up here shortly.